Yes. Good evening. First, a few words about me. My name is Arne Lepisk. I work as a software engineering co uh, consultant at a company called uh, HiQ. I've been doing C++ for like too many years, 13 years professionally and some more years before that. Today I'm going to talk about something I chose to call unexpected behavior. What do I mean by unexpected behavior? How many read this as undefined behavior? Everything I'm going to show is, to the best of my knowledge, well-defined. One small, small, small exception that is implementation defined. Um, yeah, everything is legal, but it gives some kind of an unexpected results. I chose, I've chosen to classify these un unexpected behaviors as in three different, as three, three different kinds. First, the odd ones. That's code that may, might look strange. And by looking strange, it might, it, the surprise might be that it even compiles. Then we have the Murphy kind of unexpected behavior. And by that I mean something that a user might write. And by mistake, it does something else than, than one would have um, thought. And last, the Machiavelli kind, where an evil programmer goes out of his way to, to uh, trick or deceive the user. And please, don't try this at home. Or well, do, but don't try it in, in production code. Not anything I show here today should ever pass a code review. Let's start with an easy example. What will this print? What the code does is that it takes an int and by number by number it <coughs> prints it. In first example, 15. What if we put this in? Any takers? Kind of odd. What happens here? In C++, as in C, every number beginning with a zero is, a, uh, is, um, yeah, is an octal number. So we're actually not dividing num with 10, but with 8. Anyone has have done this? Yeah. And from my previous classification, I would classify this as a Murphy kind of unexpected behavior. Next, did you know that an URL is valid in C++ code? This will compile fine. But is it? If we add, then we get an error. <laughs> what happens here? Any takers? HTTPS. <laughs> yeah, the suggestion was to use HTTPS. That works fine. A label and a comment. So this would not pass a code review of by several causes. Go to, for example. Yeah, the label part and the comment part. I don't know how many of you are up to date with the newest uh, or the next C++ standard to be, C++ 20. 
But if you are, you might have heard about the spaceship operator. Uh, and the spaceship operator is used to um, make three-way comparisons. Hopefully it makes code easier when you make your own type, that the types that you need to check for equality, inequality, less, and so But there's actually possible to make kinds of spaceships in earlier versions of C++. How? Yeah. One easy C++ 17 way, we'll find a template and then that kind of looks like a spaceship, doesn't it? Like small cannons. <laughs> but say you're not using, this is with some modifications, you can use this in earlier C++ version as well, versions as well. And in C++ 98, we can write this. Or even that. That kind of looks like a TIE fighter from Star Wars, doesn't it? Like the, well, at least the special TIE fighter that Darth Vader used in the sixth film or third, depending on which way you count. And with the same technique, we can uh, make others if you use C++ 11. Does anyone know what happens here? Yeah? So well, they're using tree graphs to escape like characters that some people may not type on their keyboard. Almost. The, the comment was that we use, we're actually using digraphs. Ah, true. Then, yeah, sorry. C++ plus defines something they called uh, digraphs. And as, as the comment was, it's used, it's a, also a legacy from uh, C. And old versions where character sets didn't have all, all um, characters for like the curly braces and the angle braces. So what we actually write, here's a table of the examples I just showed. Very closely related to the digraphs are the alternative operators. Also because some keyboards or character sets didn't have all, and this may, might be easier to write, and instead of the double ampersand and so on. But if you look, these aren't all, that, uh, all um, alternative, there are some others for XOR and so on. But if we look at this table, some of these symbols can be used in, um, for other purposes in C++. So these are the ones I could think of. There might be others. So instead of writing this, someone might write this. And then if you write a whole clause, these are equaling. Please don't do this. And this works due to the translation between the, the, the different symbols, identifier-like um, operators, I think it's called. It happens so early in the, in the compilation process, so you can use them in this way. But please don't. Okay, time for a small quiz. What will this code print? Any takers? I heard zero, I heard one, I think. You're both, both correct and wrong, because this will print different stuff in C++17 and pre-C++17. And it all comes down to this. This is a trigraph. <laughs> and what it actually is translated to, the trigraphs are also used for old compilers that 
the old systems that didn't have all keys. And they are evaluated even before comments are evaluated. So this will be translated to a backslash and, uh, and a new line. And if you remember that correctly, it's a backslash followed by a new line is a line continuation. So the while is actually commented out. And the trigraphs are deprecated or, or removed from C17 onwards. To be fair, uh, at least with normal compilation settings, both GCC and Clang will warn about the trigraph removing a line. So this is actually what's evaluated in pre C17. More quizzes. We have an overloaded function foo, takes a car and an int. What's called in this, these cases? <coughs> the first one is rather straightforward, a car. But if you add one to a car, what, do, what, do this, what, what does that evaluate to? An int. Pretty straightforward. But then we have the case we add two cars. It's int as well. And now we're moving a bit into Murphy territory. Say we have this code with the same definition as before. And we refactor it like this. One would think that this would call the same code, but it doesn't. And this is due to a process called integral promotion that all arithmetic operators on cars and on shorts on, are, is converting the cars to ints. And here's the caveat I talked about before. And this is dependent on a car actually uh, fitting in an int. If it's not, it's, could it possibly on some on some platforms, it's into, uh, promoted to an unsigned instead. And this also is true for shorts. And this is actual usage I've seen of this, rewritten, of course, in live code. This is equivalent, equivalent to this. The plus sign promotes the character to an int. So you print out the ASCII value. Please don't do this. It's confusing as, yeah, it's very confusing. Next step. How many of you usually write using namespace STD? No hands, good. <coughs> One hand, boo. It's rather okay, as long as you don't do it in header files, then I'll, I'm very disappointed. Okay, but let's refactor this. We remove the using namespace, and we get a compilation error. That's as expected, vector is in std. So we add std and we press compile, and it compiles. Isn't that strange? Sort. Isn't, it isn't in the global namespace. R begin, R end isn't in the normal, isn't in the global namespace. <coughs> the slide title refers to one member of the C++ standard committee who shall be unnamed at this point, who referred to ADL as the devil. So what's happening is, as the V is of a type, standard vector, etc., it looks for the methods R begin and R end 
not only in the current namespace, but also in the namespace that V is defined. And this is called our argument dependent lookup. A bit confusing, right? And why I used R begin and R end instead of begin and end is because R, R begin and R end of vector are defined to you to return something in the standard um, STD namespace. Begin and end aren't technically required to do that, but all implementation as I look to, at do that. But how can this shoot us in the foot. Say we have this code. We have a struct in a namespace and we make a, a, a function in another, in this case the global namespace, taking this an arg as an argument. It works fine writing that main method. But then we add a, me add a method in the namespace and then now we got an, an um, ambigu ambiguid what, how would you pronounce it? Ambiguity. Ambiguity. I have to combine it. And you get an error. That's fine. Then you can correct it. If you have a slightly different example, we have our, our methods. We call foo. And then we add a method in, in the namespace. And we recompile it, and it calls another method. can be very unexpected behavior, right? So be very careful when do when doing... Yeah, a question, Harold? Uh, just a comment, it is actually relevant if you implement your own swap in, in implementation. Excuse me, Do you implement your own swap? Yeah. Uh, then you actually you, you need to make use of this and write using it. Mm. Yeah, the comment was that this can shoot you in the foot when doing a swap operation and others that... User-defined swap. Yeah, yeah user-defined swap, yeah. You need, you need to, to use the because you might have your own swap implementation yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, so you need to be very careful when doing methods that take arguments that are in a different namespace. Next example, short circuiting. I know that short circuiting is much more common in diff in other languages than in C++. But do you know? Do you understand what I mean when I say short circuiting? Is that in this case, if PTR is null, PTR uh, uh, foo isn't called as the expression cannot be true if one of them if one of them is false and another example is you can do this with a or function if in cache is true then the other method isn't called but this can be short circuited say that we have made our own smart pointer for some reason this won't compile because yeah, it doesn't know how to do the and then. But then we add, and then you might be, yeah, I'm smart. I'm going to add a little operator overload for this. And it works fine until someone, someone puts in a null pointer there. Because in order to evaluate this, it has to do both sides and put it into the uh, uh, AND operator. Do you understand that? That's clear. So how, how do you avoid this, this situation? Yeah, it's better to add an operator, a casting operator to bool 
to your type. Because the short circuiting properties of the logical, uh, logical uh, operators are, is only defined for built in types. And then it works. Punctuation problems. How many have accidentally put in an extra pair of parentheses? Very easy if you use an ID. What will be called here? A bit strange. Or? And the comma operator is tricky. I think we have one. We had a talk about co the comma operator a couple of years ago, right? Harald waves. And if you, for some reason, depend on the comma operator, this this will give different results. Why is that? Yeah, because the comma operator has the lowest precedence or amongst the lowest precedence of all operators in C++. So this is actually evaluated like that. Assignment has a very high, well, no, not very high, but it's higher than comma. And now we're entering Machiavelli territory. Because the comma operator is defined by default for most things, but you can override it. So if you, for some reason, depend on the comma operator, an evil library constructor might write something like this. And you get very different. You can e they could even make something that returns something entirely different, like an int instead. Yeah? Could others be templated for everything? The question was, can it be templated for everything? Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got an answer from the audience. It was, unfortunately, yes. Um, but who uses the comma operator anyways, right? If you ever done a for loop, looping over to over several different uh, over several indexes, you're actually using the comma operator there in the last part. It's fine as long as your comma operator does something remo even remotely sane. This is a way to get around if uh, if someone makes a comma operator that does isn't sane. I know that at least one SDL implementation does this because users of their SDL didn't, yeah, uh, didn't do this, so they, it broke down all their algorithms. So if you cast one to void, because you can't overload on void, you're home free. Let's go back to the first comma example I had. Actually, Saw this on Twitter yesterday. What happens if you write that? Nothing. Nothing happens, yeah. And I can actually see this happening by mistake. This isn't Machiavelli, this is plain Murphy. Okay. How do you take an address of an of an object. This is right. But remember, we're dealing with Machiavelli. The address of operator, what we might call it, the AND sign, can be overloaded for any type. It can be overloaded out of class. So, you're on your own. Luckily, there's a way around it. And it's std address of. And it does some 
if you ever looked at the code of the address of, it does some really nasty casting and actually always is guaranteed to return the actual address of. Personally, I don't even understand why you would ever want to uh, overload the operator end unless you're boost spirit because they overload everything. But yeah, but there we are. The question was, should we use address of instead? Yes, if you're using, if you make very, if you need to take uh, address of something in code someone else uses, to be absolutely uh, sure, uh, safe, you should do this. In, in most cases, no, but be aware that strange things could happen. because you never know what the address of. It, it all bubbles down to do you trust your library writers or not. So, in conclusion, C++ is a complex language. Please don't make it worse by tricking and surprising your users. Don't overload logical operators unless you have a very, very good reason to. You probably don't. It's better to cost to bool and then do the actual uh, operations on that. And if you, and this goes for all operator overloads, please be lo logical. Don't make your addition operation do a subtraction. The only thing that by convention is okay, it, it's very illogical that we use the bit shift operator to output on streams, but that's so common, so everyone's used to it, so that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Show the very first example. Very first example. There must be a better way to do this. <laughs> yeah, the double zero, I guess. Yep. So the double zero is just a lead. Yeah, the double zero is just there to trick you. It, because that's all, one is one in octal or in decimal. Yeah? yeah? Uh, I have a question. The, this alternative operator names uh, and and or uh, are the standard. Uh, because this bit me once, because Visual Studio, Visual C++ doesn't seem to define or, or uh, and. And I once ported something to Mac, and that bit me because there, these were defining some header file that it automatically pulled in from some framework, and it suddenly didn't work. Yeah, the question was about the alternate uh, operators, if they are standard. Yes, they are standard, but not in C. Oh, there are standard in C, but in order to use them in C, you need to include something. They're, they're defined as macros in C++. They are, to the best of my knowledge, built in into the language. Okay. The comment. The comment. The the comment was that the Visual Studio actually requires you to use some kind of header include, to, include to, to yeah. Even in newer standards, uh, in newer versions. The last time I tried. <coughs> okay. To the best of my knowledge, it's standard. Uh, I might be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. The address of operator you put yeah. is that zero cost, or does it uh, do a lot of checks and, and add additional? The question was if the address of you mean the in the standard STD colon colon address of if it's zero. Yes, it should be. Uh, 
at least if you it does a, some costs but as far as I understand it that all this is done at compile time if you compile without any optimizations it might be something but I think it's that can, those costs that are done in at compile time okay, okay. I don't see any more hands okay thank you